Hi guys, welcome back to the Spurred On podcast. It's Tuesday still. What a slow week it is, just waiting for that Luton game to come. But time for more Spurs news. I've been digging through the articles, trying to find out stuff that is worthy of my audience and worth listening to and watching today. First up, I'm sure you will have seen, but Rodrigo Bentancur has come out and done some uh, quotes uh, for an article whilst on international duty, saying that he's been playing for the last few weeks, his words, with a broken toe. He's basically really tried to talk down this injury, but, uh, well, I'll go into my thoughts on it afterwards. Let's, let's listen to what he said. He said, I broke it two or three weeks ago, but I'm still playing the same. I broke my phalanx. Now, I'm not a medical guy, but I wonder if that's like the phalange right at the end uh, of the toe. I had to stop for three or four weeks to weld it, and it was impossible. It was before the game against Crystal Palace in training, but here I go, recovering. Once I warm up, I forget about it. Well, for me, I think this is a an issue that happens so often in kind of top-level football, where players, it seems like they take the decision as to whether they should play on through an injury or not. And for me... I don't know if you remember, like I'm showing my age here, but if you remember Gary Lineker, he talks a lot about this actually on his brilliant podcast with Micah Richards and Alan Shearer called The Rest is Football. I can recommend it. He talks a lot about the toe problems he had in the kind of second part of his career and how it was because he wore the wrong types of boots and he never properly fixed his toe after an initial injury. So that's one thing is like Benton Coe saying, oh, I'm playing through the pain. You know, yes, that's great. What a good mentality he's got. But in terms of the kind of medium to long term, in terms of his, of his career, I don't think it's the right decision at all. And he should just be letting it heal. And then also, let's face it, we love Benton Coe. He's an amazing player. But has he been in great form? No. So when he says, once I warm up, I forget about it. It's never as simple as that. It may not be at the front of your mind, but there'll be tiny little you know, uh, movement issues, things that he's not able to do as comfortably or as simply as he would if he had no problem there whatsoever. It's the same when um, clubs and physios make players play with uh, injections. You know, sure, you may not think you're feeling it then, but not only are you doing more damage to yourself in the long run, but also there's stuff that you don't even know subconsciously that you're not doing. So for me, it's a mistake. I think we should let Bentecourt kind of rest up and have his injury fixed. You know, he's come off the back of a long-term knee injury and then an ankle injury after the Matty Cash thing. Just fix up Rodrigo. I said this actually when he was kind of rushing back from his second injury, the Matty Cash injury. I said, I think we shouldn't think about Bentecourt really in terms of getting him properly playing and starting games until next season. Get him fully, fully fit and then let him start on a complete role next season. He's just been so in and out. He's shown flashes. Of course he has since he's come back from his injury, but for me, we're not seeing the real Benton core. Sorry if that comes off as a little bit of a rant, but medical things like this really, really frustrate me. Um, and I think it's simple. If he's got a broken toe, it needs to heal. Don't you rem- remember when Beckham got a broken toe and it was like he wouldn't make the World Cup? It was so close and Rooney the same when he he was you know, the star of the tournament in Euro 2004 and then he breaks his his foot and his toe and uh, and he's knocked out. It's an important injury. It's all about balance. Anyway, so let's hope that Bentecourt, uh, you know, gets some time to, to get that fitness back. Next little story is, um, so Les Ferdinand, Roy Keane and Ian Wright were on the Stick to Football podcast. It's worth a listen. They were all asked about Daniel Levy and Spurs and uh, they've come out with some interesting quotes that I think are worth talking about. So Les Ferdinand obviously scored a lot of goals for Spurs. He, he was uh, at Spurs for, I think, seven years. I, I saw a Premier League um, Premier League Heroes show on Sky recently, and I was amazed that he was at Spurs for so long because it was definitely the back end of his career. He'd come from Newcastle, uh, he, where he was bought uh, in the kind of Keegan days, and they had Shearer and Ferdinand playing together for one season. Then he was kind of pushed out, came to Spurs when we had that amazing Adidas kit, we only had that for like a season or two, but it was both the home and away kits were so beautiful. Uh, I really wish we had Adidas again, to be honest. Um, but uh, Celez kind of came and then uh, Glenn Hoddle was the manager and it never kind of really worked. Like Glenn Hoddle brought in all the kind of veterans, really. Les Ferdinand, uh, Anderton was still playing. Teddy Sheringham came back. Stefan Everson was still there for a while. Um, and we never really got it together. We got to the final of a, of a League Cup. But Celez Ferdinand was a Spurs fan as a kid as well. So it was always kind of touted about that he might join Spurs one day. And when he did, I think all the fans were really happy. And he was a a real workhorse, really good pro, incredible in the air. You know, if you're a target man, if you're you're a young player and you think you're a proper number nine, 
look at Les Ferdinand. He was like the ultimate because he could hold it up so well, but an incredible finisher. Really incredible stats for um, QPR, Newcastle and Spurs before he kind of ended his career going off to some not as important clubs. Let's just put it that way. But anyway, he also then went after his career and uh, worked uh, at Spurs for a little bit with Sherwood uh, and then has gone on to be sporting director at QPR and stuff. So he has an insight into Daniel Levy and what he's like within the club. So I thought these quotes were were interesting. He says um, when he was asked about, uh, you know, what Levy, why Levy doesn't really or hasn't really ever pushed the boat out financially when Spurs are on the kind of cusp of of great things. He said, I've got no idea. I think he has this reputation of being a wheeler dealer and has done some fantastic deals in terms of players going out at Spurs when they were ready to leave. And I think he just enjoys that part of it. He enjoys being involved in it and making that decision. He's not alone in directors and chairman being involved in parts of the football club that they should leave well alone. I think he's done some great deals and he's brought in a fellow called Scott Munn now who's set to take over the day-to-day running of the football club. That's yet to be seen. He's also heavily involved in it. Sorry, he's so heavily involved in it that people still go to him and I don't see him putting down that mantle anytime soon. So I don't know if you saw my video last week where I talked about, uh, I went through some tweets from some of the Spurs fans who, who clearly are very anti-Daniel Levy. But it strikes me that Les Ferdinand, you know, isn't a great fan of Levy in terms of his running of the football side of Tottenham either. Um, and, you know, that thing is interesting that he said about, you know, Scott Munn coming in, but actually it's almost like Les Ferdinand doesn't believe um, Daniel Levy as a kind of power-hungry control freak is willing to let the reins go of the football side. And uh, yeah, I think it will be really interesting to see because someone like Scott Munn, I imagine, he will have come in on a brief to to really be the main man when it comes to running the football dealings. But if Levy is too involved, I wonder how long someone like Scott Munn would last, realistically. He did have some quotes out this week, Scott Munn, where he's really singing Daniel Levy's praises, but you know what these people are like when they get up the hierarchies of big business? They want to be in charge and they don't want to be kind of having their boss micromanaging them. So it'll be interesting to see how Scott Mann, Mann does. And I thought interesting quotes from Les Ferdinand as well. They're really kind of giving an insight that a lot of the people who have who've worked for Levy, um, especially kind of football people, because Glenn Hoddle has talked about when he was manager at Spurs. I saw an article just today. He's talked about how it was his most unhappy time in management because of the politics at the club. Um, and there wasn't many money at that time. I mean, that was a long time ago. That was early noughties. But anyway, as I mentioned, Roy Keane and Ian Wright were also on the, the Stick to Football podcast. So Roy Keane then uh, countered what Les Ferdinand said. He said, yeah, but in terms of Spurs, he said, yeah, but they've not won for the last 30 or 40 years. Why are they just putting it on Levy in the last 10 or 15 years regarding the new stadium as if that is all he's obsessed with? Spurs have been like that for a long time, Keane added. Well, important to remember that Roy Keane, even though he always slags off Spurs, he also talks about how when he was a kid, he was a Tottenham fan. He says they're, they're his team. Now, obviously, because of his long association with Manchester United, he, he talks about Man United more now in terms of being the, the team that he cares about the most. But he does have a soft spot for Spurs and he's always consistent keen, which is that, you know, he talks about, oh, lads, it's Tottenham or whatever. And what he's saying there, it feels like, is it's not just Levy's fault that Spurs don't win anything. It's been in the Tottenham culture for, you know, I, I guess really what he's talking about is probably since like the 60s when we won the league, because these pundits really only talk about winning the league. I know they vaguely talk about trophies, but let's face it, nobody talks about Arsenal being great because they've won the FA Cup, I don't know, four times in the last 10, 11 years or something. It's about the league or the Champions League. So that was Roy Keane's kind of almost inevitable response to it. And then Ian Wright said, but they get to a place, talking about Spurs again, and it just plateaus. That's up to Levy to make the decision. What more does Pochettino have to do to say, listen, we finished second, got to the Champions League final. We just need a little bit more. Someone has to take the leap, Ian Wright said. So I think Wrighty there is is saying, kind of agreeing with what the uh, a lot of the kind of corner of the Spurs fan base who think Levy should have pushed the boat out more. And look, I, I don't think there were arguments to say that there weren't those opportunities. Of course, nobody forgets the, um, you know, Louis Sahar and Ryan Nelson uh, transfer window where uh, Harry Redknapp really felt like he just needed another player or two of, of proper class and and in fact all we got through the door was kind of journeymen although Louis Sahar did okay so look I, I, I don't disagree that there have been moments but you know the key is Levy has always wanted to run this club off its own back sustainably and I know a lot of fans get angry with that I get it 
but also you know it's never been a financial problem at Spurs like it has been at a lot of these clubs and you know when you've come from a place where you know in the 90s it looked like your club might be going out of business and maybe it's just because I'm a bit older I'm I'm glad that that's never happened but anyway so um worth listening to the stick to football podcast really interesting um next bit of news the evening standard have reported so quite a reputable source that Christian Romero is keen to play in the Olympics in Paris this summer the Olympics only finish a few days before the Premier League next season starts And Romero will be playing in the Copa America as well earlier in the summer. So this doesn't look good for Spurs. Obviously, he's an absolute linchpin for us. And if he plays in both of those tournaments, that could be serious difficulty. I do wonder, Big Ange came out like last week, I think, and said that we'll definitely be prioritising trying to find a fourth centre-back who works to the attributes that he's looking for. And I wonder if that has something to, to do with it as well. In classic Christian Romero style, he always wants to play for Argentina. It's the most important thing for him. Um, and so, yeah, the way the Olympics works, if you don't know, is it's an under-23 tournament. But they're allowed a, a few uh, players who are over the age of, of 23 as well. And Romero is really pushing for that. A little bit more news. Deki Kulusevski got his second assist in two internationals this week in a 1-0 win for Sweden over Albania. I think uh, Kulusevski is an unbelievable, un- un- unbelievably underrated player for Spurs. I think because he's not quick and doesn't pe- beat people on the outside, uh, people almost think he's not good enough. He really is. He's only 23. We're so lucky to have him. That's my opinion. Let me know what you think about Decky in the comments. And then finally, last bit of news today. Football.London have written an article explaining how Spurs will actually, in their opinion, benefit from the change in the Uh, Premier League's profit and sustainability rules which is how it is now and and they're the rules that uh, Chelsea are in trouble over and Nottingham Forest have been deducted points over and obviously Everton have been deducted six points with another charge coming but that's going to change over the next year or so maybe quicker and come into line with UEFA's what's called a squad cost ratio system um so there, uh, football.london are saying that, that because I, I did question a couple of weeks ago whether this was a change in regulations because clubs were suffering and maybe it would benefit, you know, those clubs, let's say, let's say Chelsea and Man City, those clubs who have, you know, basically cheated the system so far. But um, here I, I've kind of tried to sub down all of the information from this article because it's very kind of financial. And I'll be honest, I'm not a financial person, but basically what uh, what it said in this in this article is it's a model which is more talking about the um, squad uh, cost uh, ratio system it says it's a model which is more aligned with what UEFA has at present the squad cost ratio rule where how much a team can spend is in line with player and head coach wages plus amortization costs against revenue UEFA's squad cost ratio rule was introduced for the 22-23 season and gave clubs a three-year window to comply with allowable figures of 90% in year one, 80% in year two, and 70% in year three. Now, if you're more kind of financially, you know, you understand finances better than I do, definitely go to the football.london article uh, and read it because then it really goes into that. But finally, in terms of a conclusion of how this will help Spurs, it says, for Spurs, they will find themselves in a position where they have significant room for manoeuvre and remain compliant in the eyes of both the Premier League and UEFA to a far greater degree than some of their rivals. Using the 2023 figures when they arrive will likely improve this picture once more, as will the potential of Champions League football next season. With Tottenham's revenue growth now placing them at 8th in world football above Chelsea and Arsenal and having closed the gap to Liverpool, the next few years could herald something bigger for Spurs in terms of their ability to truly compete. So that's really good news because the cynic in me really did wonder whether this change from PSR to the financial squad uh, cost ratio system might kind of uh, affect Tottenham in terms of, you know, Levy I think has been building up to this moment by growing the club through building infrastructure, especially the stadium obviously. And I was worried that maybe this change in system would mean that that had all been basically pointless. But it seems like actually it's going to help us even more, which is really good news. Okay, guys, thank you for watching today's uh, Tottenham Hotspur news. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you so much for the support. Please do press like and subscribe wherever you are. And if you want to become a Spurred On Pro or Patreon member, it's only a pound a month. All the information is in the description box. Come on, you Spurs.